Welcome, welcome, welcome. How's everybody doing? Hope you are doing well. My name is Andrew Kuhn, Focus Compounding, sitting next to Jeff Gannon. Jeff, how's it going today? Uh, it's going well, Andrew. How's it going with it's you? It's going great. Hope it's going great for everybody else as well. So today's podcast, we're going mm -hmm. to be talking about our friend Charles T. Munger. All right. We need a Munger bust. That's what we need. Uh, doesn't Pabri have one? He does. He does. That's he, creepy. He sold it on. <laughs> he sold it on eBay, and it's not cheap. But then, look, your margin is my opportunity. Somebody okay. else created it. Something like Berkshire Online or something like that, and they have their own version of Munger and Buffett bus. I think each are maybe like a thousand bucks or something like that. Yeah, I mean, it's just creepy because he, I mean, he's met with Munger, he talks with Munger and stuff, so it's pretty creepy to have a bust of Could you imagine, in like, coming into my office and I have a, a bust <laughs> yeah, of, that of you? That would be on satellite, yeah. That is so funny. That is hilarious. <laughs> um, but anyway, so we're going to be talking about him. He, um, we're a little bit behind right now. He was, he had his daily journal meeting, which was great. Okay. He fired on all cylinders, as expected. He hasn't even skipped a beat. It's like he hasn't even slowed down. 97, 98, I think he's 97. Yeah, yeah. 97 years old. Um, and it was a lot of fun to listen. Of course, we're going to get to hear him speak with Buffett at the Berkshire uh, event this year, which everybody is looking forward to. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the Daily Journal meeting. Got a lot of requests to do that. Um, if this is the first time you're tuning in, you're watching us on YouTube, uh, go to focuscompound.com. Jeff writes about stocks there. Uh, this is the recent investment write-ups. This is behind a paywall, okay. but you could go to the free content section. I spent a lot of time going through and uh, adding every single write-up I could get of yours, going all the way back to December of 2005. So that is all for free. So you go to Focus okay. Compounding, hit that free content section, and you will get access to that. So did you did you watch the Daily Journal meeting? Uh, yes, I did. Okay. So you did watch it. Mm. Um, what did you think of it? I thought it was uh, good. I don't think Munger. He just says it was perfect, sort of a perfect storm, if you ask me, going into it. Like everything that's happened with GameStop and the, yeah, the crazy that, mania and everything yeah. like that. You know? I mean, I knew what questions were going to be asked or whatever you want to say about. Not that I knew what questions you asked, but those are tough questions. Uh -huh. We get some of those questions. Yeah. And I'm kind of like... Yeah, it's not gonna be that interesting what the answer is. I wonder what Buffett would say about a lot of this, right? So like well, we'll the... we'll find out, uh -huh. you know, because people said that about the the letter, right? That he didn't address some of this stuff. Oh, of course. And like, yeah. well, this is stuff that's normally addressed in the annual meet, like the Q and A, by either talking to the media. Now I know he hasn't been talking to the media much, but either talking to the media or in the annual meeting, it's not usually like the kind of stuff he handles in the annual letter mm -hmm. you know kind of that sort of thing which is good right we talked about it a lot of stuff that he writes about is timeless stuff right you don't want to have somebody looking at this 100 years from now and be like what what, right. was all, what was this going on exactly and that that's his style that will be for some of these things yeah so i have some highlights that i pulled we could read it and we could talk about it get your opinion on it i thought it was okay. great and then i also pulled something that i love that i actually have on my own checklist for life it's munger's okay. operating system for life something that All i right. think is pretty interesting uh but a lot of the questions like i said were based around just everything that's been going on somebody asked uh gosh she didn't tell me that my collar's like inside out what's going on here all right <laughs> somebody okay. asked uh, the popularity <laughs> of the short-term trading of stocks like gamestop um munger basically says it's nothing fancier than gambling he said, that's the kind of thing that can happen when you get a whole lot of people who are using liquid stock markets to gamble the way they would in betting on racehorses. And that's what we have going on in the stock market. And the frenzy is fed by people who are getting commissions and other revenues out of this new bunch of gamblers. Yeah. So you're seeing that going on. Yeah. He's taking shots at Robin Hood. He's taking shots at people that, you know. I would say that like pumpers and stuff like that. You know. OTC markets reported their um, fiscal year results. Yeah, and uh, I thought that as expected, as I expected, huge volume increases on pink sheet stuff. Mm -hmm. Now they pointed out that actually more of the speculation, if anything has been happening on um, NYSE and Amex and all those sorts of things, actually listed stocks surprisingly much more than in past uh, cycles. But um, huge increases if you look at the number of retail investors using uh, their services and volume from retail. There's just a lot of indications that there's big that it's um, volume increases for them that are driven by non-professional investors. 
right? Mm -hmm. Heavy involvement in pink sheet stuff from non-professional investors. And the same thing you can see here. So, so that, when you try to handicap those results, how do you think about that in the future? They'll go down over time. I mean, I expect them to go down a lot. There's never been increases like this, but we kind of knew that because we have some data on things like that. In fact, that stuff's lagging. That report actually, I know for a fact that a month after that report ends, it had even higher results than it would have at the end. So like, I know that January was much higher than before then. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. It's more of an issue. For, I mean, for, for that company, it's more of an issue of like keeping the um, integrity of their market and stuff after a bubble like that happens and pops and stuff of the, you know, all the things that could happen, the lawsuits and the, the things like that and whatever to, to do enough to protect people and all the SPACs and all that. Yeah. So, you know, that's more of it. And they said that they said, look, we don't control volumes and stuff. It's something that happens sometimes. All I'm pointing out is if you look under the hood, you can see that it's heavily non-professional and extreme that way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thousands and thousands of non-professional users signed up that hadn't previously. Yeah. And we're using their data and stuff. Crazy. When he was talking about Robin hood, he said, Robin hood trades are not free. When you pay for order yeah. flow, you're probably charging your customers more and pretending to be free. It's mm -hmm. very dishonorable, low grade way to talk. Nobody should believe that Robin Hood's trades are free. Yeah, there's no way to, to convince people of this. It's an argument I make all the time. Um, I can't convince people uh, of that. Everyone will always. That it's not free? Yeah, no, I mean, I can't convince people to use brokers that charge a small mm -hmm. amount of money for a better result in terms of your buying and selling of stocks than for a broker that's free. And I always tell people, do the math on it. How much could it be per trade, you know, and all that. But people are just fixated on that idea of that's the expense that you're paying and not thinking about, am I getting a worse price and things? We do this with illiquid stocks all the time. And people ask about like, we use a broker that charges more money than a discount broker and all those sorts of things. That's true. But the fact is it's very small to me. I'd say it's better than free because the issue is how much we disrupt the market doing that. And I understand that for individual investors, they don't think about that at all. But yeah, anytime you have, you know, I mean, it's just hopeless that way. Mm -hmm. It's like people, you know, use Gmail or something and they're like, oh, I don't have privacy. Yeah. yeah Cause that's, a free system. They have to read all your emails and serve you up ads. Otherwise, how would it be free? Mm -hmm. So, because you can't convince people to pay five dollars a month for email. Yeah, it's fascinating. You know what's going on with like Facebook and Apple. They're kind of at each other's throats. Apple's mm -hmm. trying to make things more private and not allow right. Facebook to use a lot of their information and stuff. Like, I think you actually have to. What they want it is actually like opt in right. to your data being mm -hmm. shared and stuff. And of course, Facebook comes out and says, well, they're killing small businesses. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, Apple says, well, you guys are using the, uh, their, their data to make money and stuff like that. So it's just a weird, you know, battle going on right now. It's yeah. Like, what is free? I mean, what are, you are the customer. If it's free, you're, you're the customer in some way. Right. I mean, I think years ago, if it was, um, before a lot of this internet stuff, people would have been more upset about Robin Hood things. But I think that Google and Facebook and all of that that are using all of that are free and that you have no privacy has really helped people with the idea that you want free stuff and you want to have your information about you exploited to market to you and things mm -hmm. like that. And this is similar to that. Mm -hmm. You know, it feels the same way to people. So I think they're more okay with that. And it's interesting too, for like us on YouTube, it's not like we make a lot of money for the ads on YouTube and we're not even trying to make a lot of money. Right. But the way the algorithm works is it'll put you in front of more people if you have ads on it. Because then Google's making more money mm -hmm. off of it as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean. Yeah. Crazy. On specs, Munger says, well, I don't participate at all. And I think the world would be better off without them. I think this kind of crazy speculation in enterprises not even found or picked out yet is a sign of an irritating bubble. It's just that the investment banking profession will sell shit as long as shit can be sold. Quite the statement. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I mean, I feel the same way. I think SPACs are terrible. I don't think that they should be allowed. But, but... you did make the point that at some point there's going to be a lot of legitimate businesses Absolutely. Trading, you know, that are more public. Yeah. Now. And we're willing to take advantage of them if that happens, you know, if they trade below the value that they have, if, if certain of these deals, you know, if a lot of people, it, it creates a shareholder base that isn't very interested in staying in for the long term. So if things turn down there, 
it may be attractive. You know, that's true with any of these bubbles and things. I think in the um, when when Buffett was starting out with his personal money in the fifties and stuff, I think he bought into some uranium stocks because there had been this wild boom in uranium stocks and then they imploded. In the seventies, I know he invested in some of the things that were tied to the like conglomerate things he was complaining about mm -hmm. in his letter. Yeah. Some of those got to be hot stocks and then they completely imploded. Um, he did he bought junk bonds of dot com things in the two thousands. So these things that are bubbles or are, or are irrational or whatever you want to say in the beginning, they're, they're very speculative, eventually can have investment merit. And SPACs, by the way, they're designed often will have investment merit later because you're often taking a speculative overpriced arrangement that you have that's bad for your investors, but buying a legitimate business. So mm -hmm. it can turn out to be like, you know, Tyco. Tyco is basically a fraud roll-up type thing, but it was a roll-up of totally legitimate and sometimes very good businesses. So eventually you break that up and it has value to people. Same sort of thing with SPACs. On treasury bonds, government stimulus, and low rates, Munger says, I do think that we don't know what these artificially low interest rates are going to do or how the economy is going to work in the future as governments print all this extra money. The only opinion I have there is that I don't think anybody knows what's going to happen for sure. I love that. Larry Summers has recently been quoted as being worried that we're having too much stimulus, and I don't know whether he's right or not. Mm -hmm. Pretty rational. On higher stock prices due to low rates. This is what a lot of people talk about okay. when it comes to artificially low interest rates. Munger says, I think everybody's willing to hold stocks at higher price to earnings multiples when interest rates are as low as they are now. And so I don't think it's necessarily crazy that good companies sell at way higher multiples than they used to. On the other hand, as you say, I didn't get rich by buying stocks at high price earning multiples in the midst of crazy speculative booms. I'm not going to change. I am more willing to hold stocks at high multiples than I would be if interest rates were a lot lower. Everybody is. Mm -hmm. Thoughts on that? Yeah. It's kind of going back to what Pabri talked about with him and Costco and right. his stock holding at whatever it was, 35 times earnings, 40 times earnings throughout the process and how Pabri has said he didn't think that he would buy or initiate a position right. today, but he also won't sell. Yep. I think that makes a lot of sense. And what he said is true. Um, you know, you're probably not going to get rich buying the, these high quality stocks today. So, but why would you sell something when you don't have something better to do with it? And because of where interest rates are and stuff, you don't have something better to do with it. If the Fed funds rate was 6%, might he sell something and hold cash? Maybe. Mm -hmm. A lot of people might do that. Sure. I think that would affect stock prices. He did talk about Costco. He said, Costco, I do think, has one thing that Amazon does not. People really trust Costco will be delivering enormous value. And that is why Costco presents some danger to Amazon. They've got a better reputation for providing value than practically anybody, including Amazon. That's a pretty bold statement. Yeah. I don't know if I believe that. Yeah. Because I, I know with anything with Amazon, it's always going to be first class. If there's ever an issue, no need to fear. They'll fix it. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, I think they both have very good reputations for what they're doing. Um, it's interesting. I actually I have looked at some things, and I, uh, over time, have bought less from Costco and less from Amazon in the last year or two. Wait, say that one more time? I bought less from Amazon and less from Costco recently. Yeah. Were you just going to, like, a separate store for it, or what? I think it's just a matter of saturation. I've been an Amazon customer for uh, 17, 18 years, something like that. And it was that it got to be such a high amount of my spending that I think the competition, any competition takes some business from Amazon. And, and there's no doubt that everyone has gotten better versus Amazon. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in the early days of the internet, there wasn't a lot of free shipping, a lot of availability of that stuff, a lot of good websites from different things. Now there's all of that from everybody, especially because of the pandemic. So, you know, but there's still a lot of customers for them to win over. And, you know... Costco has a smaller customer base that's very loyal and spends a large amount of money. And Amazon has that with the Prime thing. Costco's business is a little bit more like Amazon Prime, I would say. If you just took Amazon Prime members, that looks a lot more like Costco. Uh, Amazon sells to a lot of other people who aren't Prime members, though. Somebody said, can anybody become a great investor? And Munger says, I think people have the theory that any intelligent, hardworking person can get to be a great investor. 
I think any intelligent person can get to be pretty good as an investor and avoid certain obvious traps, but I don't think everybody can be a great investor or a great chess player. I don't think it's easy for ordinary people to become great investors. Yeah. A lot of people listening to that deflated. Thoughts on that? I think 19 out of 20 people are born in a way that they will never be a great investor. But, you know, there's certain ways you can invest. I mean, you look at like Schloss and you look at Peter right. Kondo and you look at Buffett and you look at Munger and you look mm-hmm. at the way that they all invest. All of those investors are great investors in their own right, I would say. And they pretty much all did it differently. Yeah. It's not IQ. It's emotion. It's the the psychological aspect of it. That's the problem, you know. The problem is that most people are not comfortable um, being out of step with everyone else, even for a meaningfully long amount. I mean, most people are not willing to look dumb in a way that is outside the crowd, you know, and you're going to have to do that once in a while. So that's really hard. Um, but they, although you mentioned people like that, they each were willing to do that. Schloss was willing to be invested in things that he could never talk about at a cocktail party. No mm-hmm. one cared about any of the stocks he's invested in ever. So that's really being willing to, it's not being contrarian or whatever, but it's willing to spend your entire career in an area of the market where everyone else says, well, that's, that's, you know, not uh, high finance stuff that's boring it's whatever it feels weird especially right now too when i explain like you know what we do and stuff like that mm-hmm. how it's boring not sexy not gamestop not nfts not bitcoin everything like that yeah i'm also just not interested <laughs> to hear about it there you go yeah. yeah and so eventually you can uh convince yourself that you should be involved in that stuff and buffett's had faced this a few times and kundal was short japan for a while that was very hard and that's why I recommend that book. Um, there's always something to do because it's really good. I think he talks one time about how he like had a dream about it and stuff mm-hmm. about the Nikkei and things like that. So that went on for a few years and he was very right. That was, I mean, that's a bubble beyond anything that we've seen, um, the Japan bubble, but it took years and years. It kept getting worse. You mm-hmm. know, it was the biggest bubble there had ever been in Japan. And then it probably doubled from there. And then it still went up a little bit after that, you know? Somebody asked him about happiness. Yes. And he He's gave his expectations. Normal. Yep. Yep. The first rule of a happy life is low expectations. That's one thing you can easily arrange. If you have unrealistic expectations, you're going to be miserable all your life. I was good at having low expectations, and that helped me. Yes. I agree 100% with Munger on that one. If you actually listen, I think it was reading in uh, Damn Right when they talked about he just went through a divorce and he was just running the odds of him yes. actually finding another mm-hmm. wife. It's in the snowball, too. It is in, yeah, the, yeah, snowball. It's in the snowball. It was just like completely low, and he just was basically like, he's never going to find another wife, or he's just setting those expectations in his head. Yeah, I've done that math, too. <laughs> I can do that math for other people and yeah. explain to them, you know. On choosing a spouse, this part I thought was kind of funny. Um, he said, a little wisdom in spouse selection is very desirable. You can hardly think of a decision that matters more to human uh, yeah. like to your life than who you marry, which is very true. Um, and then he said, I remember watching this live. He's like, <laughs> yeah. oh, you know, I had a failed marriage, so I don't think I'm in the perfect position to advise a young about marriage. Yeah, that's always the interesting one when people ask for advice about marriage. The problem is that you can either take advice from someone who's had a bunch of bad marriages um, and then they have a lot of experience or someone who's had one good marriage who therefore has no experience. People, they have one decision yeah. that could be uh, purely luck. Yeah. People take a lot of, like people ask Buffett and Munger a lot about yeah. marriage advice and it's kind of funny. I'm not <laughs> judging, but if you look at like Buffett's marriage right. with Susie, mm-hmm. uh, you know, yeah. I don't know. And then uh, if you look at Munger's and now it sounds like with Nancy, uh, the second, I think it was his first wife was named Nancy, Nancy as well. As well yep. Yeah. So Nancy. that's interesting. Um, <laughs> uh, it sounds like the second one was great for him. <laughs> Yeah. He doesn't mm-hmm. talk about, I haven't read a lot about like his family life and stuff. It sounds like they're pretty private other than, you know, what they've There's talked a lot about in Damn Right. And damn right yeah. But, other but than that, you're right private. that when answering questions and stuff, he doesn't usually mention family. A lot of people, I feel like a lot of people know way more about Buffett's Right. They might not guess stuff. how big Munger's family is and stuff from the way he answers questions. Yeah. He's got like how many kids? Yeah. So uh, yeah, you would probably guess that he didn't have kids or something from the way he answers the questions. So I really like this when he was talking about how to learn about businesses. Okay. Because, you know, we always talk about, and you always say how you think people could learn more from reading history. Uh, yeah, as I agree with to his being answer in the to this. I rem- this is the answer I remember really well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So he said how to learn about businesses. What, what was his answer? Do you remember it? Yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. So he talks about the canals and the building, the railroads and all that. Yeah. 
He's well, basically going through the foundations, learning right. the fundamentals, learning the mm -hmm. foundations. You know, he always talks about like this lattice work in your mind. And this is essentially what he's doing with businesses and what he does for, you know, the way that he thinks people could learn and, um, you know, just attain knowledge about different subjects. He's basically saying with businesses, right? So yeah, canals and the buildings of the railroads and so on. Um, you saw the ebb and flow of the industry and the creative destruction of economic changes and so on and so on. And he, you know, he talks a lot about like GM mm -hmm. and how he would have loved to read about them having success and then the eventual failure and everything like that. Just really studying history, how capitalism works, the fundamentals of it and learning from a framework. Yeah, I think that's really useful. I mean, whenever I mention things about a company um, like that, I feel like people don't, rem um, I mean, they can't remember, they're not that old, but they forget that GM had incredibly high returns on equity in the middle of the last century. Mm -hmm. So it, it, car business wasn't always a bad business. It was a good business for the leaders in it at that time. Um, canals, I don't think many people remember there was a canal boom uh, there. You know, now when they talk about green uh, energy and stuff, they don't remember canals, railroads, telegraphs. I mean, it's interesting the things. Um, I did read a book recently about the telegraph. And it was fascinating because it when it started talking about it, I knew it was going to do this, the book, it was then going to compare it to things about the internet. But what was funny about it is as I was reading it, I was like, this sounds exactly like the dot-com stuff. People yeah. talk about how it would bring everyone together and it would bring, bring peace. There would be no more war and everything because people would be in constant contact with each other and, mm -hmm. you know, they'd understand each other's cultures and whatever. And, you know, and it would solve all these problems and all that stuff. Um, and so it's it's interesting when you read about those things, you know, because uh, these things really did change life. I mean, railroads, that's incredible change to life of places. Um, I mean, yeah, it's, it's good to learn about those things and how it was financed and why there was a boom in it and that it really did change the world. I mean, the, it really changed things. And that then think about that when you think about stuff like green energy, space stuff, whatever that is, you can both believe about how big those changes will be and also wonder, well, what will the returns on capital be? Because you're going to need a lot of capital to do those things. And mm -hmm. what did, you know, how did it work out for the railroads and canals and things? Some of them worked out really well and some didn't. They completely changed the economies in their places, but they didn't necessarily make all the people uh, rich in the same way that, you know, owning a lot more boring businesses did. It seems like the evolution of a lot of industries is there's this massive boom, right? Mm -hmm. Go and take market share as yep. much as you can. And then there's the bust and then it's yeah. the consolidation phase. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. You know, and he talked a lot about how business is a lot like biology. Mm -hmm. And if you put yourself in his shoes, being born in 19, what, 20 something? Because Buffett was 1930, I think. So Munger would be like 1924, yeah. something like uh, that. 23, yeah. He says, think of, think of what's died in my lifetime. Just think about the things that were once prosperous that are now in failure or gone. Yes. Whoever dreamed when I was young that Kodak and General Motors would go bankrupt. Mm -hmm. It's incredible what's happened in terms of the destruction. Of course, that history is useful to know. And it's interesting when you think about that. Put yourself in his shoes and go back, you know, like, because I've been reading a lot of history and mm -hmm. it's, you go back to 1924, the world was a lot different. Yeah. I mean, he mentioned Kodak and stuff. Photography was an incredibly important part and it's been wiped out by digital things mm -hmm. that way. Um, some things like General Motors and stuff is through internationalization that changed everything about it. They're huge changes. I mean, there's just tremendous changes. If you look now at the um, index, 25, 30%, something like that of the S&P 500 is probably information technology. Mm -hmm. And um, a few percent, less than five, is probably energy and utilities. I mean, even taken together, they're probably that low. Uh, materials is pretty much down there. That stuff used to dominate it. If you look back at when Ben Graham was investing, when he started, um, the most securities actually were um when he first went to wall street probably most securities would have been railroads of some kinds there was utilities railroads industrials was like you know there were financials industrials that were kind of their own section but the more normal thing people would invest in is railroads mm -hmm. and utilities yeah so all of the stuff that we consider almost everything we talk about businesses you know meaning non-financial businesses that aren't railroads utilities or banks or insurers we that's mostly everything we talk about yeah and that was considered pretty speculative and, you know, that's what they call industrials and a category that, you know, was not so much for people seeking dividends and things like that. It was considered, you know, speculative stuff, not investment stuff. And now that's considered very normal. So weird because I'm currently I'm reading 
House of Morgan, mm -hmm. sort of like the 1800s. And okay. I also read Fool's Gold. Did you recommend that book? I can't remember if you've told me that. I did right. not recommend okay, that. Okay, so book. there's this House of Morgan I would recommend. Yeah, House of Morgan. House great. of Morgan won like a, I forget if it what National Book Prize or something. It won. Yeah, House of Morgan's great. So there's this guy on Twitter, Maxfield on Banks. Okay. His Twitter's great. It's literally just all banking. But he has on his website, I told him I would give him a shout because I really like his okay. website. So I'm making my way through all these books. All right, so all let's banks. say it. So it's Maxfield on Banks? Yeah, Maxfield okay. on Banks. I'll put the link in the description. Go check out his stuff. He has a couple essays. and then. But what I'm trying to do is I'm going to go through every one of these banks, these books oh, about banks okay. one by one. I'm going to force myself to even read the one. So ones that's that not on Kindle. So some of these aren't on Kindle, right? Yeah, correct. I've wanted to read that one. Uh, yeah, Baker and his bank. Yeah. yeah. So he's yeah. got a lot. So... So I found fool's gold through here, but I was like, I swear Jeff has talked about this, but maybe you haven't. Maybe this I've is good. So yeah. So I mean, two of those are pretty famous failure things. Yeah. yeah. So the Texas ones, I don't know if you'll remember. But a lot of this stuff well. on these books about banking. I mean, look at 1840 to 1955. Yes. Who in yeah. the right mind wants to read that? But I think that's that also covers from. it a bit. Money of the mind covers it too a bit. The same thing. The same bank. Yeah. Yeah. But it's interesting. Like so, you know, reading like House of Morgan. Oh, that one I mentioned to you before tearing down the walls oh really so bef that covers jamie diamond a bunch yes yeah, well. because yeah. that was before jamie it was written before jamie diamond's kind of second career um and it's the the most complete one i'd read about sandy Weil. so it's interesting to read that and then read um last man standing or whatever yeah. that book's called yeah he's got that on this yeah that's one of my favorite books yeah read that with it's interesting because you have the perspective because if you read the sandy Weil book um, that was from before Jamie Dimon's kind of second career. So it, mm -hmm. it sounds a little different, you know, because Sandy Wilde at that time was really famous, not Jamie Dimon. Now Sandy Wilde is like a footnote to the Jamie Dimon story. Yeah, yeah. exactly. But uh, so reading, you know, just different times, right, in history and stuff like that. Like, so reading like House of Morgan and then okay. thinking about reading Fool's Gold. And if those two were in the same room, right, and listening to like all these CDOs and CDO Squared and everything that right. was going on in 08 and 07 and what led up to that. It's just fascinating how old fashioned stuff from House of Morgan would have been like, that's just absolutely insane. Yeah. Just technology change and, and stuff like that, you know? Yeah. But what you see is, you know, just expansion into, which you'll get if you read um, Money of the Mind, is over time it does expand yeah. more and more in, into, exp, you know, bankers and the others exp, uh, getting experience with democratization of credit, right? Mm -hmm. So, like, learning how to lend to more and more marginal uh, companies and more and more marginal consumers and then getting comfortable with doing it even though the fact there's some losses and stuff and so same thing with speculation i mean you've read some old books about wall street stuff you know it's amazing if you look at these specs what four out of five i bet are uh, unprofitable yeah. when they go public now mm -hmm. and investment banks are completely relaxed about that fact now well if you, you look know, at um in the 60s they wanted they say uh should we be putting something that's unprofitable out to public investors and things you know it's weird like you think of like even ackman in his SPAC, mm -hmm. he hasn't so people are just betting on that he's gonna find a deal and right. the deal and it's gonna be you know this transformative yeah. thing yeah but if there's so many people that's doing it then you accept it as being normal yeah you know eventually it just becomes a thing that you accept as you know everyone Everyone does this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you would like this. I gotta send you this because I said I'm gonna work my oh. way through every single book in here, and I think I've read. So a lot before. of these are older books. They're well, that's why be, I want to read them. Yeah. So you're gonna get them used? How are you gonna get them? Because I bet a few. Yeah, I've bet quite a few of these, if I remember, have not been put on Kindle. No. Yeah. So House of Morgan, I'm listening to. It's like 34 hours. Yeah, but House of Morgan's the well, best one on that list. Yeah. 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 House, Mor House of Morgan's Gold. very good. That's Cherno. Yeah. Yeah. I like it. A I like it a lot. Yeah. And he went on to do, you know, um, political books, historical books, but he started out as a financial. Look at this. Look at that book. Biography of Bank yeah. of America. Yeah. The Story of Bank of America. Yeah. So I'm going to work my way through that. I'm going to put this in the uh, description because if you're interested in banks, oh, there's there we go. Gold. I swear you recommended it, but maybe not. It was a great book, though. I did not recommend it. So great book. Anyways. So how does that connect to what we're talking about? I don't remember. We're <laughs> okay. talking about Munger with history or something. I just yeah, with history. Guy, yeah. Oh, so you mean because out. you're reading those different banking books? Yeah, yeah. Well, I was just saying, like, imagine George Peabody talking to the people that create all these different CDOs and everything like that. Yeah. You know? 
Yeah, it is interesting to read those past things that way. Buffett talks about how you, much you can get from reading old newspapers, and that is true. I thought about doing that. Yeah, it's pretty it's pretty interesting to read really old newspapers to see how different things were and how people talked about stuff um, and to get a feel for that time. I've said that even for things of the dot-com stuff now because I lived through the dot-com. So mm. now when I hear people talk about it, it is interesting how different it is from what it was really like. If you went and got contemporary accounts of it, and they're online, you can find them. I mean, there were written, th- I mean, like people's is, memory of it. People have reconceptualized what happened there. Yeah, it is interesting. Really? So, yeah. What, anything that's Well, I mean, the, I think the story now is like the people were obsessed with these pets.com and things, and that was yeah. crazy, but the speculation stuff like Amazon and stuff made sense. That's true, but. I think people are forgetting the extreme amount of the day trading that was going on and just the amount of speculation on, on all sorts of stuff at that time. Um, I, I think until now, until the last six months or so, um, maybe a little bit longer than that, but, but no, pretty much that. Um, I had not seen anything like this in terms of people in all different parts of my life and stuff starting to talk to me about random stock things, and spe- like you're saying like GameStop. Mm -hmm. That's what it was like in the, everyone talked about stocks Mm -hmm. in the um, dot-com era. And it was not just dot-com things. Some very big stocks got very expensive too at the same time. Um, Something that's strange that's happened is a lot of people that do reach out and talk to me about certain companies. Yeah. They usually will put like a disclaimer in there. Be like, I know you're probably not interested in this, or I know this may be a little bit crazy going on. Yes. But I'm going to look anyways and do that. Mm-hmm. It's just kind of like, it's kind of like a weird thing to me. Yeah, I've been getting a lot of the same thing. I don't really know how to respond to it because I don't want to say, well, don't, you know, you, you kind of <laughs> answered your own question there. You know yeah. that this is kind of not what you should be focusing on. Right. So more speculation, right? Mm-hmm. Um, that there's an angle for people to act on that way. Yeah. I mean, there are some interesting things that happen in the dot-com stuff that I think people forget. I mean, one of the ones that stood out to me in the dot-com stuff is that that is more similar to now is um, uh, so there would be companies that would own parts of another company or something like that. So you have a company that owned a stake in another company, right? And there would be a discrepancy between them. And we've seen this now in some stocks where people are just interested in owning the stock with a certain name and whatever. And so even if you say, well, you know that this other stock owns part of it, so it should be able to arbitrage it away. And then you can't, it can't be arbitrage, even though that would be logical that the gap will close, it didn't close. And that happens sometimes during the dot-com era. And I've seen that now with some things. I mean, that is what reminds me of things with like GameStop and things like that. I don't think people believe that it's worth that amount, but there's even just a danger in people shorting and stuff like that because it, um, uh, because of the, the danger that the price won't correct. So yeah, we're at $187 today. I think it's probably one of the most riskiest times to be a short seller in the market, quite frankly. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting what, you know, stocks that this has happened to I, a couple of stocks i don't want to name them and stuff but a couple of stocks were things that i looked at as a value thing years ago and i think i mentioned one of them in the past and i don't know why they're just kind of discovered and whatever and i think this because it's a memorable name to people that seems to be part of it gamestop gamestop but i mean other ones have been that way even the thing that happened with like um uh Kodak and stuff, remember mm-hmm. that? Mm-hmm. Um, is because it has some connection that way to people. Like GameStop is very visible. Um, it actually has, I mean, it's closing some location stuff, but it has some of the most locations of any place in the United States. There, most people are like 10 minutes from a GameStop. Yeah, and people even from like my generation, your generation, right. like, you went to GameStop. Yeah. <laughs> so like, are we like old like record player, you know? Right, you know, right. So uh, it kind of, uh, I don't know what that's all about, whether it's a... Uh, nostalgia thing to it or a familiarity thing to it or whatever that connects with the possibility of um a story there Mm. i don't know why certain ones get focused on that way but it you know it's interesting um i've seen lots of cases now that are look a little bit like the dot-com era in that the dot-com era would have these big discrepancies between businesses that were exactly the same and i've started to see that a little bit it i found things i was you know i was looking at something in it, an insurance thing and um it's like four times more expensive than other insurers and 
you know, because it kind of presents itself in a different way and whatever and got a following and, you know, but that kind of thing would happen. I've talked about Activision and things like that. A lot of times the second or third most popular stock in a category would be much cheaper than the one that everyone was in. They were crowding into the leader in an industry. And so you had a lot of that happening. So that's the thing about history stuff. You know, I would I have guessed that only 20 years later, it'd be happening again in many ways in the same way. Um, I don't think so. You know, mm -hmm. but but that's the experience that you get from um, having all that history mm -hmm. that, you know, Buffett and Munger have. They've seen it so many times with these yeah. different things. And like Buffett said in his letter, I mean, it has some similarities to the conglomerate stuff, mm -hmm. which is interesting. And it's that's an era that I think most people don't know much about at all. Mm -mm. I don't hear that's a lot of people very speak overlooked. About it. Yeah, a lot people, of people talk about the dot com boom and then oh eight. Yep, and people talk about uh, you know twenty nine about the big crash and the depression, mm -hmm. right? So they talk about that, but they don't talk about what happened. I feel like they don't talk about what happened in the seventies. Um, that there was this boom in the sixties. Uh, very strange. You know, the Go Go Years is a book on that topic, and some people called it the Go Go Years, and um, what happened then, and also how bad the decline in the stock market was because seventy two to seventy four is a huge decline in many ways, as bad as what happened in twenty nine, um, especially when you adjust for inflation, how far down some stocks were, and that's the Nifty Fifty stuff. <laughs> and it, Buffett's career was made out of that. I mean, the next ten years, it was amazing for mm -hmm. him. The things he bought then on, and same sort of thing with Munger. That was a very bad time for Munger. He was down a huge amount in his fund. Like three years in a row. Yeah. And, you know, it was frustrating for him because obviously, as you know, the underlying assets were very good. Yeah, but because of the way market. it was quoted, he had the market's market. Yeah. So he owned closed end funds and things that the actual stocks that they owned were worth a lot more. But because of the way that you report in a fund, he was reporting at the market price of the shares that he owned, even though you could liquidate these things for mm -hmm. higher than what he was reporting to partners it was worth. So that must be very frustrating. I'd say so. Cool. Well, thank you everybody so much for tuning in. We'll do a, another podcast, a separate one, on Munger's Operating System for Life, because okay. I love it a lot. I want to thank everybody so much for tuning in with the both of us here today. Go to FocusCompound.com if you want to get access to Jeff's write-ups. If you just want free content, Hit that free content section and you'll get a bunch of write-ups going back to 2005. I thank everybody so much for the support and we will see you in the next podcast.